Okay, so I'm gonna repeat myself. Uh, so these were, we left off yesterday talking about the fundamental freedoms, which were the four basic freedoms people needed to exist in a democracy, freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including the freedom of the press and other media of communication, freedom of peaceable assembly and freedom of association, right? So after those fundamental freedoms, we have sections three to five, which are democratic rights. And it just sort of kind of talks about how our democracy works. So number three is every citizen of Canada has a right to vote in an election of members of the House of Commons or legislative assembly and to be qualified for membership therein. So it just says that everyone has the right to vote and it says qualified, that means there are certain rules. You have to be 18, you have to be a citizen of Canada. Those are the sort of very, very uh, limited things you need in order to participate in our democracy. And again, there is a push by some people to even lower that further, that, you know, 16 year olds should vote because if they vote, their issues, their concerns need to be addressed. And that might be a way to push countries to adopt more green policies because, you know, younger people are going to want a more environmentally friendly uh, world and they may not be um, as tied to the idea that, well, we want the environment, but we want to take up this oil for money. So, eh, right? So it, it would maybe in, uh, in, in, um, expand the scope of government or governments have to expand their interests to include what young people want versus saying, we will listen to you and ignore you. Section four is the maximum duration of legislative bodies. No House of Commons or legislative assembly shall continue for longer than five years from a fixed date for the return of writs at a general election of its members. So it just simply means a government has, cannot last more than five years. Now in Canada, you can call a snap election anytime you want. You can, uh, between uh, when a uh, government is elected till about five years, they can call an election if they want just to have a general election. Okay, right now, um, because what happened with the throne speech in uh, parliament, uh, it's, what the government's planning to do moving forward. And because it's a, it's a bill they want to pass or it's a, uh, has many um, requirements within the bill to pass, it becomes one of significance in our country because our, we believe in representative democracy, um, or sorry, responsible democracy, uh, responsible government, that if a government in power fails to pass a bill, then it faces a vote of no confidence which means that government has to go and start and enter into election. So right now, Justin Trudeau has laid out his policy and the throne speech. They're going to have a confidence vote. If he doesn't get one of the other um, opposition parties to agree with him, then you trigger an election, right? So it just says that, you know, you can't extend. However, governments can't go beyond five years. Uh, the only way you could do so is uh, an emergency situation, so a war or an invasion. So if we're at war, they may just keep the same government because it's easier than trying to have an election in the middle of it. Uh, then there's a sitting of legislative bodies. There should be a sitting of parliament and of each legislature at least once every 12 months. So it means that if you have a government, they have to sit and meet and discuss issues once every 12 months. Uh, they do it more than that, but they do take pauses because technically those representatives are supposed to go travel back to their constituents or their areas and then talk to the people and then go back and meet with government. But a government has to meet at least once every 12 months to discuss issues. Section uh, six is, is uh, mobility rights. So it means that you have the right to enter, uh, remain and leave Canada, right? You have rights to move to different provinces within Canada. Now, this is very important, especially during the, this pandemic, because when um, people were still traveling, right, at the beginning, when it was February and, you know, March, some of us, uh, I know some people, some teachers, some students were all going on March break. They were like, hey, it's still a pandemic, no big deal, or hey, this is not going to really affect. We thought it was, um, the information was that this wasn't going to be a massive deal. So people were traveling, and then when the emergency orders came down and they said they're starting to close the borders, people started to panic. If you're stuck in a country, does that mean you can't come back? Stuck on a cruise ship, does it mean you can't come back? 
here the charter says, look, even citizens who are traveling, they have a right to come back to Canada. My mom comes back, goes back and forth from here to Jamaica. Uh, she hates the cold, so she tends to take off. Like, technically she would have taken off about now, but she can't. Um, and in, uh, during the pandemic, she was in Jamaica, but stuck. Now, she is a citizen of Canada, uh, but she couldn't, uh, and we uh, were concerned because we wanted her to come back um, during the pandemic. And um, she found it difficult, but the government had to provide a way of getting her to come back. So while she booked plane flights, um, it took a government charter to get her to come back, to get her to come back because people have the right to return to Canada, right? So uh, that's my bill of rights. You can leave Canada, you can come back, you don't have to give an excuse. Some countries you can't leave, right? Some countries say once you're there, you're there. And if you leave, it's for very specific reasons with permission and you have to return. Okay, so that's just the mobility rights. Uh, and again, we'll talk about affirmative action programs, but that's more of section 15. And it says subsections two and three do not procure any law, program, or activity that has the object of amelioration in a province of conditions of individuals at province who are socially economically disadvantaged if the rate of employment that each province is below the rate of employment in Canada. So it just talks about what affirmative action programs are, which we'll talk a little later when we go we look at um, equal rights. Uh, that's 15. Probably look at that tomorrow. So section seven to 14 are your legal rights, right? They are rights protect Canadians when dealing with justice system. They ensure that individuals who are involved in proceedings are treated fairly, especially those charged with a criminal offense. So if you are charged with a criminal offense, which I hope you never are, but if you are, these are the legal rights that you have, right? Our system of government believes, or a philosophy of system of government in Canada, it believes that the individual must be protected. And in a straight contest between the state versus the individual, the state, sorry, the individual should take, have more power, right? The idea is the state or the government has a police force. It has laboratories. It has hundreds of millions of dollars, resources it can use to put you in jail. Well, you just have a lawyer, right? You have your individual resources. So in our democracy, especially Canadian democracy, are, we believe that people should have many protections because the state is so powerful, right? And the idea is that we must make it, we must in criminal activities, it must be the state or the government who proves that you are guilty. You as an individual are always assumed innocent and you don't have to prove your innocence, right? The government has to prove you're guilty, right? So having said that, here are the seven, I'm gonna whip through them. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, if anyone has questions, we're gonna answer them later. So first one, uh, section seven, life, liberty, and security of the person. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, and security of the person and has a right not to be deprived, therefore, and except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So life, liberty, security of the person, those are big things, right? I mean, it means you have the right to live, you'll have a right to be free, and you have a right to not be feel threatened by others in our country. The only reason why this would be limited is if you were arrested, because if you are arrested and charged with a crime and convicted, your liberty is restricted. It's not taken away. It's that you must go sit there uh, in this prison for a X amount of time, right? Until you paid your debt to society, right? But in the prison, you still have a right to live and you still, that prison, if the prison was full of people who just beat you up every day, you could argue that, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be secure in this facility. I agree that my liberties um, has been curtailed, but my life doesn't. And I should have a basic sense of security in um, a government run building. Search and seizure. Everyone has a right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. Seizure. Simply means when the police want to search you, they need to have some form of warrant or reason to search you. Sometimes there are there are laws that say the police can just search you because they think you might have done something, but that's a very tricky and dangerous slope. If they think you've committed an actual crime, they're supposed to have a warrant and a, they have to go to a judge and get a reason why they search your back. 
Now, if you're entering into a certain building, they can't search your bag. We know that I think the Highway Traffic Act allows the police to search your car because they can, because you're on the road. So there are limits to it. But again, if I'm walking on the street and I got a bag in my hand, the police officer pulls over and says, let me look at your bag. I could say no, right? There's no reason to look at my bag, officer. Am I being charged with a crime? Am I being questioned? Well, then you cannot look at my bag. Now, the officer pulled over and said, I have a warrant that gives me the right to search you. Yeah, okay. So be aware of that. They're also different, let's say, if you're traveling uh, in airports, they do have a right to go through, I mean, they scan your, your bag, right? Um, think about, I haven't gone on a plane for a while, but I don't know if they still have them. Everyone can tell if they still have them. They had the scanners that are x-ray that kind of scans you completely. Like that's searching you, right? Right, and it shows everything uh, when you're frisked. That is um, searching if you have a weapon and stuff. And remember last time I was on a plane, um, we accidentally had those little scissors and they said, you, you can't take those on a plane. And they took it. I'm like, but that's, that's our scissors. Well, yeah, you can't do that. So too bad, right? And remember when 9-11 happened, there was, you couldn't have certain types of gel you couldn't have certain types of things on the planes. Those were seizures, but they're saying they were reasonable in accordance to um, laws of the time. Detention or imprisonment. Everyone has a right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. It just simply means that they cannot just arrest you for no apparent reason. Um, and if the reasonable grounds for you to be arrested, uh, but it's also weird, again, it's also a limitation. So uh, if I'm walking on the street again, and the officer says, come with me, and throws me and says, you gotta get in my car, I can say, well, am I being arrested? Am I, what's the reason? If there's no reason, then I don't have to go with him. Having said that, if I get pulled over while I'm driving, I'm gonna take a breathalyzer test, I am being detained, and it is arbitrary because they'll say, uh, especially the ride program, they'll say, that car you gotta pull over, that car you go. Um, but we argue that that's a reasonable limitation, right? That, that that section one saves that. So arbitrarily detained in the street, it's a problem. In your car, it's a little different. And again, there should always be a reason for what's happening. Why are you being detained or imprisoned? Section 10, and you've got three different sections. Everyone has the right to be arrested or on detention, which is the three things. So when you're arrested or detained, to be informed probably of the reasons therefore, to retain and instruct counsel without delay and to be informed of that right and to have ability of, of the detention determined by way of habeas corpus and to be released if the detention is not lawful. So remember I talked about the fact that um, you've always seen cop shows where they say they arrest you, the police say, um, uh, Regina, hey, you have the right to, uh, right to remain silent, right? Now, the police do do that, but there is no Miranda law within Canada. However, if I'm being placed under arrest, they have to tell you why, right? So again, while well, daddy walked on the street, cops say, you have to come with us right now. I'd say, am I, why, why? What is the charge? Why am I being uh, arrested? And if they can't tell me, I have no reason, I don't have to go with them, right? Um, during the, and again, this happened in Canada, we talked about it, that Desmond Cole talks about being, stopped numerous times because as a black man, he's been stopped. And um, there was a big campaign about know your rights and that if an officer just stops you, you can say, there are three things you're supposed to say. I think first thing is that, am I being under, am I under arrest officer? No, I'm being detained and questioned for offense. They say, no, but, well, since I have not been under arrest, not being questioned, you have no right to hold me and therefore I'm leaving, right? Boom, boom, boom. An officer can get mad and yell at you and scream at you and get in your face, right? But they can't arrest you if there's no reason, right? You're just walking around. Now, there has been issues in the police, especially Toronto with carding, where people are being stopped and carded. And one of the arguments people made is that why am I being carded? Because technically speaking, I don't have to show you my ID. I have to tell you where my name is and I tell you where I live, but I don't have to show you ID. Right? We don't live in a country that says you have to show someone ID, right? especially when there's no reason to. Okay, So this is something with section 10. I don't, when 
if you're going to arrest me, you must tell me why I'm being arrested, right? And then I have the right to instruct counsel, which means I have a right to get a lawyer, right? Happen, and then you have to tell me I have a right to get a lawyer, and you have to have evidence that tells me why I'm being arrested, right? Just not, I saw you walk in the street, and I'm curious, right? You have to have a reason for arresting me. Section 11, uh, uh, proceedings in criminal and penal matters. Any person charged with an offense has the right to be informed without reasonable delay of a specific offense. So Tamori did, you try within a reasonable time. Reasonable time is a little difficult, right? Uh, reasonable would be, again, there are court cases that last before you get charged, before you go after you go to court, could be five years, right? So if, if I were charged with a crime and it was 10 years ago and I still haven't gone to court, I could say this is not a reasonable amount of time, right? If charge me or let me go, but you cannot just tell me I'm under arrest and not do anything about it for 10 years. So three to five between arrest to actually go into court isn't uncommon. Not to be compelled to be a witness in proceedings against that person in respect to the, the offense, which means I don't have to testify against myself, right? Which means if the police say, you, did you do something? I could just say nothing, right? In fact, I don't have to do anything ever in my defense other than say nothing. If you ever get charged with a crime, your lawyers will probably tell you, say nothing. Let the police that the authorities prove you did something wrong. Don't open your mouth, okay? To presume innocent until proven guilty according to law in a fair and a, a public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. So I'm always innocent, right? To prove my guilt. You can't say I'm guilty when I'm being charged with a crime, I'm the accused, right? But I'm not guilty. And the only reason you can make me guilty is that if I'm before a tribunal, judge, judge and jury, in a fair and open trial. You can't take me to a secret uh, uh, a jail, a secret courtroom and try me for a crime where no one knows and then get charged, right? Um, not to be denied reasonable bail without just cause, which means I have a right to bail. Bail is usually given to most, with the exception of um, people who commit heinous crimes, right? Uh, so, in case you remember who Paul Bernardo is, he uh, was a serial killer, uh, he didn't get bail, right? If I am Jeff Bezos and I committed murder, I probably won't get bail because I have billions and billions and billions of dollars and I could leave because I might own several planes. I may leave and go to a place where you can't come get me. So, uh, there has to be a reason for why you can't get bail. Right? Most people get bail, but if they think I'm a flight risk, I have a chance of running, I ain't getting bail. Uh, except, I said in offense, and a case in offense under military law trial before a military tribunal to the benefit of the trial jury where a maximum punishment for the offense and the prison for five years or more severe punishment. So if you're a military officer, they have a different legal system that's different from, uh, from our a civilian case. So they have different rules. So just be aware that if you're a soldier and you're being charged with a crime, you have to go before a military tribunal and it's a whole different set of, of rules. Um, not to be found guilty on account of any act or omission unless at the time of the act or omission, it was constituted as an offense under the Canadian or international law or the crime criminal or according to the general principle of law recognized by the community of nations. So. You can't be charged with a crime that doesn't exist, and you can't be charged because you didn't act uh, for a crime that doesn't exist, right? Unless it's something that everyone recognizes is a crime. Okay? And it's just sort of a rule that getting people to explain that when you are being charged with a crime, uh, you can't get charged for not acting, right? Uh, if someone is uh, passed out and dying and I don't want to give them mouth to mouth, you can't try to charge me for murder, I, I don't think, right? Because 
it's an act of omission. At the same time, if I give the person mouth to mouth and I crack their ribs, you can't charge me for assault because I tried to help somebody, right? The reality is that if you ever try to help somebody in a medical situation, it is rarely, if at all, you'll be charged with a crime because you're attempting to help. Um, if finally acquitted of an offense, not to be tried again for it, and finally, uh, finally found guilty and punished for an offense, not to be tried or punished for it again. So this is called a double jeopardy rule. If I commit murder, let's say I kill here, I'm going to kill, hmm, who's in the room? Hessel, right? I kill Hessel and I go to, and we go to trial and I'm found innocent, right? I can go out of the trial and say, by the way, I killed Hessel. <laughs> you can't try me for a crime that I've been found innocent of, right? Can't. At the same time, if I killed Hessel and I was found guilty and I served my 15 years, and I leave prison, you can't charge me for that crime again. So you can't, so it's called a double jeopardy rule. Once I've been acquitted, you can't try, you can't try me for that same crime. And once I've served my sentence, you can't charge me for that crime again. Uh, last one. Oh, this is a lot. If found guilty of an offense and punishment for the offense has been varied between time of commission and the time of sentencing, the benefit of lesser punishment. So it just simply means that if I get charged with robbery, but I when I was I didn't get bail and I was in jail. And let's say the crime is I get eight years, but I spent five years in prison. They'd say, well, you've done five, do one or two more and you can leave. Okay, so it just means that concept. This just explains all of the sections. Um, treatment of punishment, everyone's right not to be subject to any cruel, unusual treatment or punishment, which means you can be punished, but you can't be cruel, unusual. Uh, so that's what we don't have a death penalty. That's why they are now talking about the fact that the concept of solitary confinement is cruel, unusual, because uh, as human beings, we're social creatures. We can tell this from what's going on with the pandemic. We like to talk and be near people. And if we're not any of that, it would cause problems, right? We human beings do not do well in solitary confinement and it might cause actual damage to us. So uh, we can't be tortured can't get excessive abuse by law enforcement officials. Um, and again, we are looking, people are looking at the fact that is solitary confinement a form of torture. Self-incrimination, a witness who testifies in any presence, proceedings has a right not to have any incriminating evidence so given to incriminate that witness in any other proceedings except for the prosecution for perjury or for giving of contradictory evidence, which means if I am a criminal, and I'm testifying that I saw hmm, Thomas commit a crime. If I saw Thomas committing a, so let's say I saw Thomas uh, robbing somebody, but I saw him robbing somebody because at the same time I was uh, smashing a car. I don't have to give evidence that's going to incriminate me are based on me committing a criminal act, right? That I don't, I don't have to, I can't self-incriminate myself. I can say, I, I can't tell that information because of what will happen will incriminate me, right? So I don't have to give evidence incriminating me, incriminating me if I'm testifying for someone else, right? So you don't have to, I don't have to tell you. Well, did you murder that person? I'm not gonna say because, or, or again, what are you a drug dealer? I can't tell you that because that might incriminate me, right? Well, do you drag race? I can't tell you that because that might incriminate me, right? I don't have to do that when I'm testifying as a witness. And the last part, it's just an interpreter. So uh, a party with any proceedings who does not understand or speak the language, if the proceedings are conducted, are conducted or is deaf, has a right to assistance of an interpreter. So if you don't speak the language, you have to have an interpreter. The interpreter is just there to to make sure that you know what's going on, okay? Those are your legal rights. If anything you should know in the Constitution, know these rights, right? Your, you will, if you ever are charged with a crime, your lawyer will go to these rights right away. 
they'll probably see you and say, did you say anything to the police? Yeah, don't say anything, right? In fact, if you ever get arrested by the police, which I hope you never do, say nothing. Even if you did nothing wrong, say nothing. Just say, I'd like to see a lawyer, please. Because your lawyer is an expert and they will be your champion and they will tell you what you can and can't say, right? Because if you do say something, it might be used against you. 